Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody. So today we have the pleasure here to have uh, Professor Abby Friedman from University of Rochester to give a talk about single flux quantum circuits algorithm and design methodology. So Professor Abby Friedman was with the Hughes Aircraft Company from 79 to 91 and has be been with the University of Rochester since uh, 91, where he is a distinguished professor. He is also a visiting professor with uh, the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. So Dr. Fim Friedman was a recipient of IEEE Secrets and System Mark Van Valkenburg Award, IEEE Secrets and System Charles Dezer Technical Achievement Award, University of Russia's Graduate Teaching Award, and College of Engineering Teaching Excellent Award. He was the editor-in-chief of the, of the IEEE transactions on very large scale system, uh, very large scale integration systems, and the microelectronics journal, and the regional editor of the Journal of Circuit System and Computers. He is an IEEE fellow, senior Fulbright fellow, National Sun Yatsen University honorary chair professor, and a member of the UC Irvine Engineering Hall of Fame. So congratulations for your very a nice uh, CV with a lot of achievements. Here is just a, a, some of them. So uh, if you want to see more of the achievements of Professor Friedman, you can go to his web page. And uh, so thank you very much to accept our invitation to give uh, this talk today about uh, single flux com quantum circuits, algorithms, and design methodologies. So I leave the floor now uh, uh, to you to start uh, your uh, presentation. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening to everybody who's listening. Um, we're going to talk about a new topic um, that is kind of exciting, and it's a new evolving technology. It's called single flux quantum. Um, it's superconductive. It's cryogenic. Um, and many of the talks that deal with these topics tend to be physics-based. Um, I'm going to be talking about a different level of abstraction, specifically circuits, algorithms, and design techniques and methodologies. So the way I've broken up the talk today is into these components. So first I'm going to explain the application space. It's kind of interesting, and it might be different than what you expect. I'm going to give a little fun history of superactivity because it's fun, basically. Um, then I'm going to give some basics, you know, EE 101 kind of thing for single flux quantum circuits. I'm going to introduce the real topic, which is design methodologies, EDA for SQU circuits. And then the really the heart of the presentation today will be that bullet where it's large scale, superconductive, feels like complexity systems. Um, and then I'll summarize. Okay. So, um, so let's talk about, I mean, computers. We all know what that is, mainframes, servers. But what's, is, what's interesting now is a lot of the computing capabilities really focused on two application spaces. Cell phones, mobile computing, great. Uh, the other application space is server farms and data centers. It's amazing how significant that is now. And, and what's interesting about this particular application is that they're stationary. They don't move, unlike all the mobile applications that we have. So we can consider different kinds of technologies that we can apply to these stationary large uh, systems. And one of the aspect of these systems is that they take a lot of energy. So the point of these slides are, is this slide is very clear. Energy requirements are increasing, and it's all moving toward cloud computing and networking. I mean, some large percentage of the total energy of the, of the world is being spent on cloud computing, um, and that's a problem. And so we need a solution. Well, the point of today's talk is that single first quantum technology is a solution. Not the only solution, but a very important one. And what's beautiful about this particular technology is that and the application space that it's going to meet is that it needs to be stationary. These are cryogenic systems. You need a big refrigerator wherever you go. With a, you're not going to carry a refrigerator if you've got a cell phone. But if it's stationary, it's a big cloud center, a big data center, um, you can put a big refrigeration environment right there, and it's okay, as long as the, the energy advantages outweigh the energy disadvantages. So we'll talk about that. So here's this technology, single flush quantum, SFQ. Notice the term, single flush quantum. That means we deal with quanta or individual uh, quantum that propagate around the system. And as I'll describe later on, the existence of this quantum is represented by a one. The lack of this quantum is represented by a zero. 
It's oper we operated at helium temperatures at four at four K. It's very very cold, but it's got amazing um, energy, um, energy and speed uh, characteristics, which I'll quantify. And you can see the comparison of a large system compared to what what you need if it's just um, a cryogenic SFQ system. It's very very small. So this is a slide I always keep around because people always ask me the question, which is. Isn't the cost of the cryogenics outweigh the advantages? And so we, rather, since this isn't an environment, I'll just cut to the chase and say, no. The, um, the cost is as you scale, as you reach very large complexity of the electronics, large computing systems, the cryogenics is a very, very small portion of the total power, the total energy use. And, um, and so that's it. So, so we're trying to target exascale computing and, and very low energy. And, this, and the cryogenics is a small component of the entire thing. So, okay, so here's a little fun. We'll talk about superactivity generally. Um, and here's one of the key points for people who don't realize. It's exactly zero DC resistance. And what it's not a small resistance, you know, minuscule resistance. It's the absolute zero. Uh, and that means as long as it's maintained cryogenically, you can have current wrapping into a coil. It will last forever, literally forever. It will not dissipate as long as it's as maintained in a cryogenic environment. We have this characteristic, which is called the Meissner effect, which expels any magnetic field within that superconductor. As long as it's maintained below a critical temperature, which is what we call TC, and for niobium, which is an important material, that's 10K. And we cool it with liquid helium, which is at 4K. So this all was discovered by a fellow named Onus in 1911. Um, he was basically playing around with, with making things very, very cold, looking at mercury, looking at all kinds of technologies. And what he discovered is when he liquefied helium, all of a sudden the resistance, and you can see in this chart, went to zero at 4.2 K. And that was interesting. And that was the, the discovery of superconductivity. He won the Nobel Prize he, uh, a couple of years later, very quickly. Um, and this was the, the invention of, that tech, of this technology. I mentioned the Meissner effect, it expels um, these fields, so it's all um, around the, the conductor, and um, it's, it's very, when, when the temperature is below the critical temperature, it's, we expel the field, when it's above it, of course, it still goes to, to the material. So a little history, um, there was the, the famous London equations by these brothers, Fritz and Heinz London, who developed this, these underlying equations that were able to characterize this Meissner effect. This was in 1935. Uh, Ginsburg and Landau, developed some very important characteristics and, and I had just a little anecdote. Ginsburg came to the University of Rochester when I first got there. It was amazing how large the crowds of people who were attending those meetings. There was you know, huge auditoriums, it was standing room only. And he gave multiple lectures. It was a very special opportunity to see him. And very importantly, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schreifer developed the BCS theory that explained superconductivity. This is the same Bardeen working with, with Shatley who invented the transistor in 1947. So every 10 years, he was winning a Nobel Prize. A very impressive guy. Um, so finally, we get to an important fellow named uh, Joseph, uh, Josephson. Um, and he noticed that this interesting device, he can actually, interesting uh, characteristic of superactivity, he, he actually knows how you create a, a device, a junction. And so, so he showed that you can have a layer with a, with a material in between another layer, this insulator, and you can create this device. And we now call this the Josephson Junction Device. There's absolutely no voltage drop across it, and it's operated by these conductive um, Cooper pairs, which allows it to be zero resistance. And he also won the Nobel Prize uh, very, very soon after that. Um, just to continue, actually, with our own University of Rochester, Sid Shapiro, he was the chair before, just before I arrived, he actually discovered this effect of the Joseph effect, and noticing the step characteristics. It's now still called the Shapiro steps, named after him. And soon after him, I understand and Rowe were able to characterize this, these Shapiro steps into a general characteristic and provide a theory behind it. So these are some of the early developers of, of superconductivity. And now we, we've all heard, of course, that 1986 in Zurich, IBM, uh, Ben Ross Mueller discovered high temperature superconductivity, still not really well understood, but they've got to much, much higher temperatures, not room temperature, but much, much higher temperatures. And this is a nice chart that shows mercury, then lead for a long time, then niobium and niobium nitrate. These were early materials, and we still use niobium and niobium nitrate for superconductor materials. And then also in the, the mid-80s, we have all these interesting 
um, high temperature superconductivity. So the field is broken up into LTS and HTS, low temperature and high temperature superconductivity. And it's all kinds of interesting applications for people who had MRIs are using this technology um, as they e evaluate your body, squid devices, voltage references. But an interesting application is energy efficient electronic circuits. Um, so in the world today, in this application of electronics, there's a number of, uh, of uses, one of which is space. And space has been around, applications of superconductivity in space have been around for a long time. Um, it's, it's a very interesting environment because the, 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 the ambient environment of space is about 2.7 K. Interestingly, it's not zero. Uh, the Big Bang took care of that. But, um, but in our, in, within our solar system, because the sun itself produces some heat, it's on the, in the, order, it's the order of 3 to 4 K. So if you want to put some quantum computers into space, you still have to cool it. Another application area is military electronics, very, very high precision, ADD converters, radar, things of that sort, um, and cost is less of an issue in that environment. But as I was saying, an important application is cloud computing um, for low energy data centers. You know, these days they put data centers, you know, in the north, you know, anything that's a frigid environment just to manage the energy. Well, we won't have to do that. And an interesting new application of superconductivity and, and superconductive super electronics is quantum computing, primarily as an interface with cryogenic computing systems, uh, quantum computers. And the reasons are it's a natural interface. It operates at very, very low voltages, very, very, I mean, millivolts, um, which is consistent with, with, um, with quantum computing. Um, it also has uh, the, the cryogenic environment is it's sufficient. So there's a natural uh, application of this SFQ technology as a control interface for quantum computing. So that's another important area, and it's a very hot topic, as we all know. Okay, a little, a little background. Let's go talk about SFQ. It's, again, two superconductive layers. The Joseph Junction is separated by a weak link. It's an insulated normal metal layer and some sort of constriction. There are some characterizing phase ex ex relations with current and voltage, as I show here. Um, so that phase difference is across the junction. And the three characteristics that can put it into a superconductive state, you have to be below the critical current, you also have to be below the critical temperature, and you have to be below a critical magnetic field. So that's important. It's not just the temperature. It's also currents and magnetic fields that define the superconductive behavior. And there's models that people have developed to characterize this JJ. Um, so the technology, again, is, is a single flux quantum. It's, a, it's not a voltage level. It's the existence of a quantum state, uh, and these pulses propagate around, around a circuit. If there is no pulse propagating, we, we define that as a zero. If there is one, we define it as a one. And these uh, pulses all have the same characteristic of being 2.07 millivolt picoseconds in size. So these are very small amplitude, very small, very fast delays, um, and, th th and they're generated uh, by from overdamped JJs. Um, we have to bias these circuits with a DC bias current. So an important thing to note, and I'll bring it up later today, um, is that every one of these JJs have a bias current. They have to be make sure that it's below that, that critical current, unless you want to change it into a, a normal state. Normal state is a, is a term um, used for non-superconductive state. And there's other kinds of logic families besides SFQ. I mentioned AQFP, RQL, ESFQ, all kinds, um, but SFQ is by far the most dominant and well-known. And the, the inventor of the um, of SFQ is listed in the reference below. It's a very famous paper, Likarev and Semenov. The journal version came out in 91. I think the conference version came out in about 87. Um, and, the, and this guy, um, Likarev, invented this technology and gets all the credit, and as well as Semenov. So here's the point. Here's CMOS, you know, it's a classic power uh, delay or, uh, uh, diagram. And CMOS is pretty good, you know, 0.1 picojoules. That's not bad. Uh, but superconductive electronics, you can see, it's out of joules. It's much, much, much less. It's two to three orders of magnitude lower energy. So when you hear about people saying they want to decrease, they want to increase the num number of data centers by a factor of 10 or, or what have you, they can't do it because they, the energy doesn't exist. But if you use superconductive elect electronics, you can operate because you're already operating at orders of magnitude, two or three orders of magnitude less energy. Uh, than CMOS. And furthermore, as a side benefit, these circuits operate at tens to hundreds of gigahertz as compared to CMOS, which is one to maybe 10 or 20 at most. But but superconductive electronics, you know, you see lots of the circuits that the one that was published, shift register, a simple shift register, operating at 770 gigahertz. And many, many circuits are operating at 50, 60, 70 gigahertz. So it's a very exciting technology from speed as well. 
Um, and so there's a lot of effort to develop these technologies in this fabrication facilities. In this chart, high pressure is an important one north of New York. Um, MIT Lincoln Labs in, is, is attached to uh, MIT, and it's right outside Boston, west of Boston. Uh, you've got a couple of Japanese uh, uh, efforts, and you've got an important one in Canada, D-Wave. And so there's lots of effort to produce, fabric to fabricate these JJs. Um, they can get to about a million junctions, you know, a million devices per die. We want to get there. We, we want to do this on a more regular basis. We also want to scale. And so the catch is we can do a million if they're very regular, very standard structures. As But to do practical, highly complex circuits, that we can't do. And that's much, much lower complexity. And the reason is we need to be able to automate the design process. So that's what today's talk about. That's what today's talk is about today. We're going to focus on how do we automate and what are some of the efforts that have been done to automate the design of SFQ circuits. In the same time, in parallel, there's a lot of effort being to improve the fabrication and manufacturing capability of SFQ. So let's just motivate EDA a little bit. We all know in any chip design, there are custom design flows, there are structured custom design flows, there are semi-custom like ASICs and, and stand cells and things of that sort. Well, in our RSFQ, pretty much everything is custom. And that doesn't scale, as we all know. And so the effort is, how do we develop structured custom and semi-custom ASIC type design flows for SFQ, and that's today. And so here's a classic diagram that you've all seen for all technologies, abstraction levels on the left, different design uh, requirements on the right and the top. Um, and so this is a, this could be CMOS, but we want, we want to also have this capability in SFQ. And that's where the, the focus is. There's a lot of effort to develop these capabilities. Um, here's an example of what we're going to talk about today. There's efforts in the area of synchronization because I didn't mention it, but every one, almost every one of these gates have to be synchronized. Um, every junction needs to have its particular bias requirement. We um, One of the issues in SFQ is memory or the ability to make memory, and I'll talk to that as well. Uh, interconnect is an issue. How do, you, how do you move signals around a chip? And, and other issues like testability and hardware security are also important. So, okay, here's really the beginning of my talk. Um, I'm going to talk about various kinds of ways to automate um, superconductor circuits to achieve VLSI complexity. And I broke it up into th to these six categories. Um, I'm going to go one by one. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, now I'm going to talk about interconnect, and then we'll go from there. So again, these are the abstraction levels that it affects. So there, in, in this business of SFQ, we can't just have a line. Um, we need to either, there's really two approaches to connect two logic gates. If there's a very close distance between the gates, then we use active components. We call it a Josephine transmission line. I, I picture it here on the right. Um, and these are active components that just abut from cell to cell. So you've got a, if you've got a logic gate, you attach it to a JTL and you propagate that JTL until, cheap, until it reaches the destination gate that's right to do it. So it's gotta be very close. It's using up resources like current and power and also importantly area. So um, area of the active components. So it's something you only want to do when the distances are very short. So what people tend to use is something called a passive transmission line. And this is for long, for more long distance or medium level distance interconnect. And the way it works, it's a transmission line where you have a driver and a receiver and a long strip line. So it includes some circuitry, but then it drives a course chip. And that's the standard approach to move um, data around a circuit. So you can see there's a bit of an overhead. Just for a simple interconnect line, you need a driver and a receiver. There's another issue that's very important and very problematic in, in SFQ circuit design is that I told you the idea was you produce a pulse. A pulse gets propagated around the world, around, around the circuit. Um, well, it only produces a fan out of one. That, that pulse it can go to one place and only one place. So we have, what we have to do is go through the process of splitting the pulse into multiple pulses. So if you have a fan out greater than one, you need what's called a splitter circuit. And we'll talk about some efforts in the area of splitter circuits here as well. But that's a big issue. So every time you've got fan out greater than one, you need a splitter. So you just doubled your, your gate requirement if you need, if you've got a fan out of two. So th these are some of the issues in SFQ. It's not, it's not, CMOS is a very straightforward technology. Another issue that's different from CMOS, and that is the dominant coupling mechanism is inductive, not capacitive like CMOS. It's all about the inductances. It's all operating at very, very high speeds. Um, and we have to be able to extract it. And we, we probably realize that unlike capacitive coupling, which is a near 
for, uh, a near, nearest neighbor kind of phenomenon, inductive coupling is a long distance phenomenon. And so it's you have to be very careful and understand the inductive properties and where the coupling is coming from and where, how to characterize the coupling. And so there's an issue of inductive noise coupling, which is a very significant topic in SFQ. And you can see in the circuit in the bottom that we actually use inductances to as the loop <coughs> within the circuit. So we have these um, inductive loops. Um, and so the inductances are everywhere in the chip, both intended and non-intended. And related to that topic is this issue specific to SFQ and magnetic fields, where we actually can track flux. And that is bad. So sometimes, so what happens is you, you lower the temperature, you cool down below uh, TC, and these, the flux gets trapped in areas within the chip. And if it's in the wrong areas, it can disturb the symmetry of the circuitry and disrupt it. And it basically, it's a parasitic effect that can be very catastrophic. And so as part of the design process, the classic way to do it is what they call moats where they actually embed moats around the layout to intentionally trap any excess flux that might be floating around. And there's other approaches where we get, also get rid of um, uh, flux, where we use resistance and narrow lines, and basically make it more resistive and less inductive. So, um, and try to you know, affect the magnetic fields. Um, and so one area of research, very importantly, is how do we drive automated routing? That's a big issue now. So we're moving into this ASIC environment so you know, we have these, we're building a, a large stand cell libraries composed of SFU gates. Well, guess what? Now we have to route them. And so now we have to think about how to route them. And do we use JTLs? Do we use PTLs? We, I discussed that already. There's all kinds of trade-offs. You can see that the JTLs are very, the delay is very dependent upon the length. If it's a small distance, it's fast. But for a long distance, it gets very excessive and takes a lot of area. So the PTLs, there's a constant delay. You pay, you pay the price for a driver and a receiver, and the, the, the path trip line is pretty much independent of length. And so they're constant. And so we tend to use PTLs. And so we're developing routing tools now that are PTL-based to support the ASIC design environment. Um, now we all know about repeater insertion in CMOS. Well, we have the same problem in these PTL interconnect, but for a different reason. We have resonance effects. So you have these signals that are so fast because it's you know, superconductive, it's cryogenic, and they bounce back and forth, and they and they resonate, and they and the resonance come back, and they, the reflections come back, and they affect the incoming signal, and so we have to recognize that, and so that puts a limit on where we how long a line can be without partitioning it. So very similar to CMOS, we insert another uh, driver inside that strip line to basically amplify it and make sure that the, the um, reflectances are sufficiently short so that there's no resonance effects. And this is described in this paper here. So this is a brand new concept we, we've kind of discovered only in the last year or so, last year or two, um, and we've developed this methodology. And here's a very nice closed form expression that advises when and how many um, repeaters to insert into a PTL line. Uh, I mentioned splitters. So splitters are a problem because found out of more than one, you need a splitter. And so there's been a lot of work to, in, in, to derive new kinds of active splitters that are more efficient, passive splitters that use fewer junctions, um, multi-output splitters rather than a one to two, it can go one to three or one to four um, to save the number of junctions because you know we can do a million junctions, but it's hard and we don't want to spend it all on splitters. And that's a big issue. And so we, this, um, this, these results have just recently come out in the area of splitter design. Um, so that's a good kind of a little summary of some ideas in interconnect. A very important topic is in the area of synchronization. So like, like CMOS, like silicon, um, there's all different ways of doing synchronicity. Uh, the standard way, way to do it is a common clock that we distribute to every receiving register in CMOS. But unlike C, uh, CMOS, in SFQ, almost every gate receives a synchronous signal. Expect the exception are the are the splitters and a similar kind of structures that go that affects the fan out. But besides the the fan out structures, every gate um, requires a synchronous clock pulse. That's a big overhead. So that's what I'm saying. By most logic gates need to be clocked. Um, but there are other approaches that are asynchronous and mixed timing techniques, which I'll talk about here as well. So let's talk about fully synchronous approaches. Um, so here's an here's an algorithm that we recently developed. Um, on quantum-based clock tree synthesis um, that's composed of clock tree scheduling, clock tree topology design, and clock network synthesis. So in other words, first we want to schedule all the arrival times of the clock signals, and that's where to, to affect skew for each of the data paths. 
And so the data pass is gate to gate. It's not register to register. So there's a lot of data paths, and we have to choose the right kind of useful SKU to optimize the schedule. And then once we know what the schedule of the SKUs are, then we want to convert that to a clock tree topology, and we want to synthesize it properly. We want to insert JTLs where it makes sense. We want to place them. We want to do we want, we want to synthesize this network, um, and we want to place it properly, snake any 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 lines. So here's a system that we've developed for CTS. Um, and here's the point about class scheduling again. Again, every logic, almost every logic gate needs to be individually synchronized, um, and it greatly exacerbates the clock uh, tree synthesis problem. Um, and here's just the basic core problem. You set up linear expressions for each of the, the path delays, between, in this case, between every gate. You define what's effectively a permissible range where you can tolerate a certain skew, and you, and you generate an arrival time schedule for every single gate. Uh, we developed an algorithm for clock tree synthesis. We evaluated on the AMD 2901 uh, microprocessor, and here's a good data point. It, the processor only has 1,000 gates, and we needed 1,000 splitters just to support the 1,000 gates. This is a classic one to two splitter. So the point is that the splitters are a huge overhead. But the good news is we were able to do good uh, CTS on this AMD circuit, um, and we showed it, delay balances not exceeding 1.6 picoseconds, fully there. And so you can see the maturation of our clock tree synthesis process, where we can have, we can build it. We can develop uh, a CTS or a tr clock tree or a clock network that supports large scale or reasonably large scale circuits. Um, there are other ways of doing synchronization besides fully synchronous systems. GALS is one of my favorites, globally asynchronous, locally synchronous. So there's a lot of different ways to do large, large chips where locally we keep it synchronous and at different, multi, uh, different clock domains, and we transfer to larger, globally asynchronous systems, all communicating asynchronously to these local clock domains. And the last one is a fully asynchronous environment, which has also been looked at in great detail for SFQ. So we've developed topologies uh, for GALs, with the different bus topologies and how to share the interconnect. We've done all these all these structures. And so this work, there's early work now in how to apply a GALs approach to SFQ. Um, there's other ideas that are out there. There's also a lot of work in, in, in asynchronous, but I, I was worried about time, so I took it out. Um, but every gate has is composed of two pieces, a storage loop that, that inducted with a JJ and a decision-making pair. And we use the clock to maintain the state within that, within that structure, within that storage loop. And so the idea is if you've got all these different um, uh, storage loops requiring all these synchronous circuits um, so that we can maintain the state, can we do it without a clock? That's the point. And that would make our life a lot easier. And, inter and interestingly, it would start looking like CMOS. So all those classic CMOS concepts where we don't have to clock every single gate becomes interesting. And so there's been work in the area of self-resetting storage loops. So the basic idea is you kind of integrate a, a small resistor into the uh, into, near the inductor, um, and we, uh, near the junction, and you um, extend the retention time. And there was a very nice uh, result very recently, 2019, by Ryloff from IBM, where he was able to uh, further evolve the uh, the loop and to create what's called a dynamic SFU circuit. The point about it is it's not dependent upon a clock uh, requirement. It doesn't have to be clocked. It's got a fast reset. It can store the state, and it doesn't need to be clocked. And so there's a new area of this is brand new. I mean, this is publications coming out in the last year. Um, and so this area of DSFQ now is a, a, is a topology for gates. And we've done a lot of work in my own lab and others um, where we are developing ways to characterize um, and, uh, and extend these DSFQ gates into majority gates. Um, so we've laid out structures. Um, here's an example of some work um, where we extend it, and we're actually looking, now we enter the world of logic synthesis, which is a whole new research area. Which So now that we can build these DSFQ gates and we have majority gate structures, we can actually start applying it in ways that will give us the opportunity to, to do logic optimization and logic synthesis. And this is a research area that's just brand new and just being looked at now by, by some of the leaders in the field. Um, so that's the area of synchronization. As I mentioned to you, almost every gate has to be synchronized. I can tell you every gate, every junction needs to be biased. So that's a big issue. So 
here we have to distribute the the bias current to every junction. Um, we want to maintain the robustness, which in, in SFQ speak means to improve the margins. Um, we want to lower the power. We want small small area, um, and the goal really is to have kind of an approach, simple, not too simple to not too dissimilar from CMOS, where we have distributed LDOs on a large uh, CMOS circuit. We want to have distributed power regulators or current regulators around each block within a large SFU circuit. And so there's been a lot of work developing guidelines for how do we do distributed regulator design for large scale SFQ circuits. And so initially what people did is they had some sort of resistor bias distribution. You can imagine how that would work. Just no different than a voltage divider basically. And you distribute current and we did, we've done that in CMOS forever. Um, but we noticed that the resistors um, are taking a lot of space. Resistors don't come naturally in SFQ. And so they take a lot of space. And so we want to make it smaller. We want to decrease the power. But then what, what, what happens is all of a sudden the data becomes data dependent because it's dependent upon the frequency. And, and so, so, so along came the concept, rather than work with a resistive uh, distribution system, why not work with an inductive system? So we replaced those resistors with inductors and we added some JJs as current regulators or limiters um, and that's pretty much what people do today. Um, and that's where we are now. So we'll look and we we create what's called a feeding JTL. And, F, and the acronym is an FJTL, where we control the voltage at these nodes. Um, and the way we do it, 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 it is we run it at the highest frequency. There's an interesting relationship where the voltage that's produced is a function of the clock frequency and the phase characteristics. And so we, since the clock frequency is the highest frequency on chip, it sets the highest voltage on chip. And therefore, we can set the bias right, and we can control and regulate the current that comes into each of the gates. And so this feeding JTL distributed around the chip is what we feel is, is going to be the next approach for doing power delivery. And so there's lots of issues related to um, providing. So SFQ became energy efficient um, SFQ, and now it's inductor-based. Um, and there's all kinds of issues. How do you bias the JJs, the inductors, these feeding JTLs? Um, we need guidelines. And you can note, for example, here's a picture of a, of a chip produced by Hypris, where the feeding JTL, look how large it is compared to the, just, just one eight to one mux. So things take space. And so there's an issue. Um, so we built a whole family of guidelines. They're described in this TVSI paper. This is just a, uh, a tip of the iceberg. But to give you a taste, you know, if if you, if you run in situations where it's under biased or if it's over biased, you know, how do you want to redesign the circuit? How do you want to change the feeding JTL? How do you want to ensure that you maintain the state within your the regime of operation that gives you the right current? So these guidelines are all been documented and and characterized. Um, there's another topic that's very important in SFQ, and that is the amount of current. You remember, this is cryogenic. We're trying to keep things cold. Last thing we want is a lot of current running around. Um, and it's just hard to bring the current from the outside external source into the to the cryogenic environment. Um, so, so there's been some interesting work, very recent, on doing what's called serial biasing, current recycling. People may have heard of the term in CMOS called voltage stacking. The idea of VD, VSS, and VSS being some VD of the next layer in in a um, in a CMOS environment. Well, in an SFQ environment, it's the same concept. You basically share the current. So you have the current do work in block one, and then you use the same current moving down into block two and three. So you reuse that same current and you do things serially. And the term we use is either serial biasing or current recycling, uh, which is the same concept as voltage stacking in CMOS. And we want to partition the circuit to support these, these that they can use the same current, that the current between blocks is about the same. If there's an imbalance, it's a problem. In CMOS, we have to add regulators between each block. Well, here we're looking at other ways to control the current flow between the various blocks. We want to equalize that, that bias current. Um, and so here's some work that was done recently on how to partition a gate to equalize the current between blocks. And here's just a, a pretty picture that shows how we moved a general circuit into four blocks to equalize the current each of the block. We showed up only approximately 1% bias and balance between the blocks um, and very efficient. And this is the beginnings of, the, of solving the problem of current recycling for partitioning RSFQ circuits. And here's a, a very recent paper that's just, just, get, just impressed now. So this is all recent work. Another topic that's important is the area of memory. Memory is the essentially the holy grail of, SO, of superconductive circuits. It's always been a hard problem. 
And so people have built superconductive SFQ, SFQ based memory cells, but they take an inordinate number of, of junctions and it's just not area efficient. I mean, people do it, but the classical ways of doing it have not worked out. So people look at other approaches. One approach is just use CMOS, DRAM. Good news about DRAM, cryogenically, you don't have to refresh. So it's very nice, except for there's a little catch. It's, it's, it still takes a lot of power. And you don't want something that's power hungry in a cryogenic environment. It stresses the cryogenic uh, situation and it gets very expensive. Another application that, that's been looked at very carefully, including by my own group, is using magnetic memory, spin-based memory, MTJs. And these devices can operate cryogenically. They're also a, um, a, a two-terminal device similar to a JJ, and and you can and you can operate and they can provide a nice high density memory. So MRAM, magnetic RAM, is a nice application for this technology. Um, the catch is they don't operate at two millivolts; they operate at a higher voltage. So you have to interface properly. And so there's been a lot of work uh, looking at interface structures. And one device that was developed by a fellow at MIT. Um, was called an, uh, an entron or a nanocryotron, where it actually warms up at a certain current level and shuts off the path, or you can access the path by running it uh, cryogenically. And we've done a lot of work in developing different kinds of scent amplifiers for this environment. So there's some work at, at superconductively driving cryogenic MRAM with, to provide that, that, that memory. But one of the most exciting solutions was some work being done at a Northwestern um, and other places. Uh, look at not rather than a two terminal device, looking at a three terminal device. And we all recognize the value of a three terminal device, CMOS. It's a pass transistor. It gives us the, the pass transistor into the memory cell for CMOS. Well, we're trying to do the same thing in superconductivity. And these people at Northwest have, been, have invented what's called an SFT device, superconductive ferromagnetic transistor. It's a stack of ferrous material with insulators and superconductors. And we now have a switch. And this is, again, this is 2016, but these, this work is still coming out. There's new people developing switches. So now there's a chance to achieve and find that holy grail where we can actually develop a um, three-terminal uh, switch and now therefore have a very easy and efficient way to do a superconductive memory. And, and we've done a lot of work in, in modeling these effects and different kinds of characteristics of these SF, SFT devices, very high accuracy. Um, so this, this is an evolving field also that's brand new. So one of the themes you should be hearing from me today is this is not something from 20 years ago or 40 years ago. This is in the last year or two or three, all evolving, all developing, and very dynamic and very exciting. And if we're successful, we're going to be defining the next cloud computing system, which is a very important application. Um, so another couple more areas is in the area of testability, for example. Um, so this is classically. So we, we take the ideas of CMOS and we apply them to SFQ. Uh, because it's still logic gates. I mean, you have to recognize, particularly in SFQ systems, they're cryogenic. Um, so you just can't just put your fingers down and probe into a node. You're inside of this big cryostat, and you can't get in there so easily. So you need some sort of automated way of managing and controlling the flow of data in and out of the system to be able to evolve for both production testing and debug testing um, some sort of DFT technique. And so here we took the ideas right out of CMOS, and as, as we all know, there's a huge and rich literature in the area of DFT for CMOS, and we've applied it now for SFQ. And so we've got other results where we use D flips like a blocking gates, similar to a multiplexer. So we basically insert local test points to allow us to get access to very difficult regions to be able to ascertain the characteristics of different nodes uh, in a large circuit. And we have all these supporting uh, logic structure to allow us to do this. Uh, we have set scan change against classical CMOS technique, where we allow the data to be moved, uh, you know, moved through the system and pulled out, so we can instantiate different data at different points within the circuit, and we can pull out data when we want it to be able to ascertain the state of that particular uh, point of, within the circuit within that gate. Remember, each gate has a memory element because it's got a storage loop, so every gate is basically sequential. This is a different world. So I'm going to repeat what I said. Every gate is essentially sequential in SFQ. So that it stores a state. And so we want to be able to pull it out, insert states, be able to test it, debug it. And so we want to create the set scan environment. And so this is something we did actually a few years ago. And uh, we're going to we're continuing working on this area. Um, another topic, that brand, brand, brand new, is an area of security. Um, and we're talking about, again, these cloud computing systems, large data centers. Data is very, very sensitive. 
A lot of it's industrial, a lot of it's the US government and other governments, highly sensitive data. We need to be able to thwart any forms of reverse engineering, our very important and evolving project. So if we ever get to the point where SFQ becomes a primary use of data centers, we have to make sure it's secure, both hardware and software. Um, so we've done some work. In this case, it was a collaborative work with some people at NYU in Rochester, where we were able to camouflage different kinds of cells. Uh, we replaced dummy devices. We basically, instead of acting as a, as a Josephine junction, they, act, they operate as a resistor, but you can't tell by looking at, the, at, at a chip. You know, if you strip off the chip, it looks like a JJ, not a resistor. So kinds of tricks like that. And we have a fairly serious publication that describes different approaches to camouflage. A recent publication, again, just in press, so this is brand new stuff, was on logic locking techniques, where we actually use a secret key, to, uh, which is only known by the user, to bias the, to define the bias current to control the logic gates. So this is a, a way that's only, it's hidden from, from anybody who gets control of the AD circuits that they can't um, get into to the structural function and understand how it's operating. So it's a, again, it's a brand new subject. Logic locking is very, very exciting and important. I'm just hardware security in general. So that's my talk. I was trying to give you a good overview. There's a few more points I want to make. Um, the main point is that um, this is an important application. Data centers, cloud computing is going to increase demand. The energy requirements of these guys are out of control. And what's interesting about this, they need low energy and it, and it can be stationary, unlike your cell phone. So SFQ is a really good application. Uh, technology for this application. It's two to four orders of magnitude lower energy, two to three orders of magnitude a higher speed than CMOS. That's important. Not so much the speed, but particularly the energy. Um, and it's a natural technology for stationary systems such as cloud computing. There's a lot of work. It's very much ongoing. Um, a lot of work at USC, for example, that I work with closely and, and Rochester and a few other places and a lot of companies uh, developing circuit and design methodologies uh, to support this new this new problem, uh, multiple uh, algorithmic effects. Which, which we're going to build. I mean, they can get to a million junctions barely, but they're going to expand beyond that. How do we design these systems? And, and and we can't just start then. So we're starting now, and we're and we're developing tools um, that are very that are very efficient. Um, and, and another point to make is there's a classical application of SFQ, which at electronics, which is space. And there's a new, evolving, exciting application as an interface into quantum computing because it's naturally there. It's millivolts, it's cryogenic, um, it, it's often the same technology. So it's very exciting. Um, just you can talk to Cubans. So that's the, the, the real idea. One little um, comment we just finished a new book on this topic um, on single fuzz quantum integrated circuits. It's literally just was submitted for publication less than a month ago. It's going to come out in a few months by Springer. Um, and so this is a good way to get started. There are a lot of books on superconductivity. Most of them are written by physicists. There's a few books um, written on some physics and some circuits. Most of them are outdated. Um, so there's a new book. There's space for a new book in this area. And so this is specific to SFQ. But let me also say there's other technologies besides SFQ. As I mentioned, AQFP, RQL. So this is an evolving technology. And I'll also say, and I, don't, I should have added slides to it, um, there's even new ways of doing um, superconductor electronics, which are without inductors, which are another hot field, which is just, just burgeoning, really exciting field. So it's all kind of expanding and it's very interesting and, um, and the field itself is just wide open. So I'll leave you with a pretty picture of, um, of my, our campus uh, during the most of the year because we never get any snow there and it's always green and pretty. So I'll leave with that and, um, and I'm prepared to take on questions. Well, thank you very much, Abby. Very nice and inspiring talk. So uh, we have here some questions. So first one is from Magdi L. Morsi from uh, Siemens EDA in Oregon, USA. Right. Former mentor, now Siemens EDA. So uh, his question is why every gate needs clock, not only the sequential and and how those uh, uh, single flux quantum being modeled? Ah, um, okay, Mandy, how you doing? Um, so the, the answer to your question is um, the, the, the simplest model, as they call it, an RSFQ, uh, um, it's just a, a simple resistor in parallel with a JJ 
um, to describe it. And so it's a, there's a very simple model. There's, by the way, there's, there's spice routines. There's, there, these, two, these, these devices have been well modeled in, um, in SF, in, um, that for, for spice environment. So, um, so you can get something called like WR Spice, and there's a lot of other examples of, of, of SFQ or superconductive tools that have been tailored with the proper models to support spice-like uh, analysis of, of these circuits. Um, these, these circuits need to be synchronized to control when the flux comes in and how to, and how to manage the, the movement of the data around the gate. Um, Ricardo, other questions? Well, thank you. So there is another question by Professor Sergio Bumpy from here. Maybe as Bumpy is logged here in StreamYard, I'm going to put he, he can do the question oh, directly. OK, why not? Well, Ricardo, I'm, I just uh, unlogged from, uh, from the YouTube, but uh, you can read the question from there. The right. first question has to do with the, with the ferromagnetic stack. Do you right. get any issues of mismatching of temperature, uh, uh, stress when you when you stack up the ferromagnetic and the superconducting? Right. What is the trick there? The trick there to get this uh, ferro ferro transistor, ferro superconductor transistor? I mean, these devices literally were invented only a year or two ago, and so there. I mean, there were, I mean, at one point I was on a project, a program with, with the U.S. government where the goal was sixteen bits. I mean, that was the, the, the goal. Um, and so we're trying to evolve these technologies and, and the issues of, of robustness and stress and, um, and um, management, uh, controllability of the parameters is still in flux. So, um, I mean, I, to be honest, I haven't looked at the, the latest, greatest paper on SFT. Um, I would recommend to go to, um, to, North, to the Northwestern site. I pointed out, I gave you the reference in my talk and see what they published. It's brand new. So these technologies are absolute ev early evolution. I don't know the latest number. It's not going to be very big. It's going to be very small. Okay, thank you. Sure. So, so the, the ferromagnetic material is something like a, a soft circuit steel. Is that the one? Could you repeat that or what? Is that still a, a, a soft circuit? What's the ferromagnetic material that will work best with the... Right. With the, uh, the and you, can, you, can, you can get papers there out there, and you can see what kind of materials they're using. Um, but it's going to be... You know, this field is moving so quickly that what you're seeing is, six, by definition, is three to nine months old. And I suspect what they're using is going to be a little bit different. But, but you know, IDM has papers now on it and other places. And so it's a hot field. Um, and so, and it's not just SFT. There's other devices I've seen, other forms of switches that people are already uh, developing. Um, and so now it's expanded because they realize this is the requirement to make um, superconductive electronics reliable we need a memory and we need to talk to mtjs or we talk to make our own um but sft would be a very nice solution and uh, what's the what's the current let's say density that people can take can can realize with the let's say with the most uh, with the older you know single flux uh, loop well, in that you have no mtj uh, it, neither it, it, uh, in, have, what's it, the density, bit density that people are achieving today yeah, but they're achieving very, very small. I mean, we're talking hundreds of bits and things of that sort. Mostly demonstration vehicles. But um, yeah. it's not a viable solution just to use a classical SFQ solution because the area is just too big and they use too many junctions. So you need, you need a different solution that makes more sense. Because they, one of the weaknesses of classical SFQ is there was no natural switch. And they would use like five or eight junctions just to create a switch. And that's not what you want. You, you know, you want most of the SFQ doing the memory storage and a, and a simple pass transistor to control the flow of data. And so now they have it, but everything is in development and evolution. Oh, congratulations for such a great work. You are helping to move this uh, field so much uh, faster forward. Not just people Thank, Thanks for being with that, uh, you know, the South, uh, South region, uh, the regional mine, uh, and the CAS uh, society in this region. I, I, congratulations. I, I, thanks a lot. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And someday I hope to, I, I hope to get down. It'll be fun. Yeah, well, when things get normal, certainly we will. And, and we'll be many steps ahead in memory density and more uh, you know, advancement in the field. And it's a great job that you guys have. This, this medium you've been using uh, for presentations is a wonderful result. Congratulations for you. For you. So if any, anyone any has uh, 
some uh, new question, please uh, do it now. So I have one. Um, so nowadays, uh, in the traditional standard self flow, we have a step that uh, is called the technology mapping, where we have to change the our logic equations to cope with the functions that we have in a library. Right. So the step in reality, uh, this optimization step, because uh, we cannot find in a library all the functions that uh, we can have. So, uh, and uh, we are working here on uh, physical design automation of the layout to be able to generate any logic function in order to reduce the uh, amount of transistor being used to to implement a chip, you know. So right. we can say that nowadays uh, uh, a lot set of circuits are using much more transistor than is needed. Right. So how you can uh, uh, see this uh, issue uh, when uh, you are doing uh, SFQ, if you can have a real logic optimization, considering that you could uh, do any implementation of any cell in the uh, ESP. Right. Right. So, so I, I hit that later when I was talking about some of the DSFQ, that uh, some of the cells that we've developed that allows that logic optimization process. But this is a good topic. There is some work in it um, at EPFL. I've seen some work in the area of SFQ and, um, and logic optimization. I've seen some work um, um, from Synopsys. Um, so this is a topic that is um, evolving, and it's another example of uh, interesting problem that has a lot of appropriate. I mean, we have a library. We have a standstill library in SFQ. And mention and remember that I, that I made the point that the fan out is one. So maybe you want to re-optimize your logic gates to minimize the fan out, control the fan out. Otherwise, you're adding a splitter cell every time you add a gate. There's a lot of nice research problems here, um, yeah. and people are working on it. But again, this is a brand new field, and you know, we'll see whether it's the one that wins. But I, among the superconductive technology, it's by far the most mature. Um, and so, yes, logic optimization, logic minimization, um, you know, technology mapping from SFQ, from something into something, um, SFQ is totally uh, relevant. It's a logic. Um, High Press, for example, is working with Synopsys in developing a, lot, a large um, SFQ logic family. Um, and then they have to map it. And people are looking at ways to map it. So there's lots of effort being looked at right now to um, to convert and manage logic gates and map it into SFQ. When we did the AMD 2901 test case for TTS, that was just one piece of a larger problem that we were working on, where we we're trying to map the entire AMD 2901 into SFQ. Um, and that was done not by me, but by other uh, people in, in at Synopsys, to be accurate. Um, and so that that's, that was an important result. And they showed they could do that. And the question is, what's the what's the cost in terms of gates and things of that sort? So, um, so there's a lot of work in this area, and there's a lot of people interested, and it's wide open. Lots of research. Okay, thank you very much. So I see no more questions here. So I would like to thank uh, first to Abby for this very nice and inspiring talk in a hot topic. So I hope to have uh, then another talk by you in, in uh, still this year in the traditional CAS workshop we do each year here in the south of Brazil. So thank you very much to all you. Thank you again, Professor Abby, for this very nice talk. So have you all a good day. Bye-bye and a nice weekend. Thank you.